Welcome to Creators Are Brands, part of the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. I'm your host, Tom Boyd, and let me tell you, this episode right here is out of here. We talk to an artist, a self-taught designer, and multifaceted creative entrepreneur who is hell-bent on teaching everyone how to find their inner creative voice. Her name is Jenna Rainey, and straight from her website, it says she's undeniable proof that the starving artist narrative was made to be broken from her YouTube channel around her art to her courses that teach business to her patreon to her books to her affiliates her small creator team generates over seven figures a year and in this episode she shares the behind the scenes of her business mindsets for selling as an artist and her creative process this episode is jam-packed with gems and is going to be one of your favorites as you continue to build your creator business let's get into this conversation with jenna rainey so is that the is that the art studio that you're in right now? Yeah, it's a bit is messy that, right behind is me. Is that but. on your property? Uh huh. It's in our backyard. It's it used oh. to be the garage. Yeah, it used to be the garage, um, That's and then the, dream. the previous owner converted it to like a livable space. But it was hideous before, and then we just recently finished remodeling it. That's it the dream. absolute dream. It, it, so it's not like it's not like you can like leave your main house and go uh-huh. into your creative space. Yep. And we have oh. a sauna out there. So if I want to take a break and get like sunshine or go in sauna. Yeah. It's really nice. And then the shower is just right a few steps that way. So nice. there's also a shower in here, but I don't use it. And there's a lot of natural light too that I Lots. see. Yeah. We have oh. two skylights up there that you can't see. And then a bunch of windows. The door has tons of windows. Yeah. I'm seeing that. Lots. Oh, it looks glorious. It is that, glorious. That, 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 I, that I talk about that. Um, that I think the one guy from... I think it's convert kit. Uh-huh. Nathan Barry, he put a uh like a I think he put like a mini house in his like one of those what are those the houses the tiny houses? Tiny house, he, yeah. He put like a tiny house in his backyard and like that's his all I'm like it's it's nice to be able to like for uh-huh. people that work from home to like kinda have that separate space. Yeah, and I love that because of it having the house like livable element with the kitchen and we have like two chairs back there. It's more comfortable than just like yeah going to a separate office you don't have a place to like sit and write or like take a break or whatever yeah so or or if uh this is what happens with us is is since we both work from home we'll be like kind of in a creative flow Uh and then you go to the kitchen to get a snack or something Uh and then like someone brings up like something on the schedule a couple months like like, hey did you and and then it throws you all out of your mental space hours later (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. so now you have it all right there in front Uh of you but Jenna, yeah. welcome to the show. I I I I'm already loving the jam so far. Um, I'm excited to finally get you on the show. Uh, my my wife put me onto your your creator world uh, through the course. I remember she was like, "I want to get this course called Brand Plus Brand." Uh-huh. I feel like I feel like I'm going to get value out of it, and I just like trust the creator so much that I just like I want to get it, and I feel like it's gonna um. It's it's gonna help me, and she's been going through this this course for like, on and off, like for about like three years. Like she'll revisit it when she needs it, and she's okay. kind of uh, as she's building her creative portfolio. So, brand plus brand. Tell me if I'm wrong. It's like about um, uh, it's like helping you license your art. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's for yeah. art licensing, meeting agents, connecting with agents, or doing it on your own, turning your art into repeat patterns. A lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and and for someone like me that kind of geeks out about this world is. From the outside looking in, there's so like there's kind of this notion about like the online course world, That's how us. like th- you they aren't valuable or they they're they're scammy like kind of this yeah. this idea of what it looks like. And I see firsthand that no, there there is another world to it. Maybe like they're not just as loud and yelling at you in the, in the YouTube yes. ads, but uh-huh. but they actually it actually is possible. And and uh-huh. so that's what got me into your world. And then I started listening to. When you came out with your podcast a couple of years ago, uh-huh. and you were doing solo episodes, and and she was like, "You just listen to an episode with me," and I think it was like your first or second one, and you were, I think, recording in in like the closet for like good sound, <laughs> and and it was like so candid and casual, and I was like, "This is cool," and it inspired me to actually start mine and start doing oh, solo fun. episodes. That's awesome. Yeah, those were the good old days when I started <laughs> my podcast. That was like right after I had my son Miles too, so it was pure chaos. But <laughs> yeah. And yeah. and you got a lot of other things going on as a as a watercolor artist, designer, published author, self proclaimed color theory expert, creative entrepreneur, and mama. 
What, sure. what would you say your main like channel is for connecting with your audience? So if people are listening along right now and they want to kind of go peer into your world. Yeah. So if you were to ask me this three, four years ago, I would have said Instagram was my main channel. I started posting my work on Instagram, my artwork on Instagram in 2012 or 13, early 2013. And it was growing very rapidly because that was the days of Instagram when it was uh -huh. like timeline was just what working yeah it was working there was yeah, no like yeah. crazy algorithm and stuff yeah, that yeah. It, you had it, to compete it with it got in front of your audience <laughs> right yeah at the time you posted it, it. yeah what yeah. a wild concept yeah um and hashtags were kind of blowing up too and actually working and i was getting millions of views on every single video i would post it would just go crazy and i was posting like three times a day it was a very different very different world. I was gaining hundreds of followers a day. This was like 2013 to 2016 or 17. And then it was just like a hard stop, like slow trickle of people coming in here and there, but hard stop on Instagram. And four years ago, almost four years ago, we launched our YouTube channel thinking like it would be a, a slow build, a slow burn to get people converting over from Instagram or email list and then just organic people just organically finding the channel. Um, but it's currently my biggest platform. We have 235,000 subscribers currently on YouTube. And then we have, or I have 2,000 or 217,000 Instagram followers. And so in terms of like numbers and audience size, just in general, uh, the largest one where I have the biggest reach would be YouTube. However, I feel like the biggest impact that I have, not just with revenue, but also just with helping people, bringing value to their lives, et cetera, is actually my email list, which is a significantly smaller chunk of people. It's 62,000 subscribers on my email list. So it's in, you know, comparatively speaking, it's significantly smaller, still a big size, but um, impact wise, I would say email list, but size and just like reaching right now it's YouTube. Okay. I got a couple questions. Okay. One, uh, when you launched the YouTube channel, how did the did the YouTube did the Instagram subscribers um was there like a like a direct correlation between uh like carryover from uh people on Instagram and then just immediately jumping to YouTube or was it not so much you kind of had to build organically on YouTube? It was actually pretty surprising. John and I, my husband is my video guy and YouTube everything. He does everything on YouTube except for teach the the tutorials. Um, and it's a good setup. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. And so he's when he started working with me full time four years ago when we launched the channel, and it was like right after we had our son Miles too. But um, we were like, oh, this will be easy to get a few hundred, like a few thousand people at least over to the channel because we have this large group of people on my Instagram. And at the time, also my email list was more established. It wasn't the size that it is today because this is four years ago, of course. But it was still a big sized email list. So we were like hopeful that there would be a lot of cross pollination. There would be a lot of people trickling over from other channels. But YouTube is such a different place. Like I don't subscribe to YouTube channels. Like I don't understand the person that does that. I appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. I'm not yeah, saying yeah, that yeah, as a thing. Yeah. I build I'd my business it, around it. I yeah. don't get it though. <laughs> I, I really don't. Like I, yeah. I've never been a person who uses YouTube as like, I'll go on it and use it as a search engine. And like if I need to learn something or hacks yep. on how to hang something in the, you know, like whatever I'm trying yeah. to figure out. But I'm not like, oh, I'm going to hit subscribe to this channel and I'm going to wait for every single video every week. They drop new videos. I'm going to watch every single one and comment and be active on the platform. It's just not my it's just never been my thing, I guess. So that was kind of a little bit of a we should have been more. I guess estimating that to ha happen that people wouldn't really cross over because it's such a different the activity and the users are very very different from Instagram and email list to YouTube. So yep. it was mostly organic, mostly people finding us through the algorithm through the feed on YouTube, the like if you like this video, check this one out type of thing when you're at the end of a video or on the sidebar. And so there's been a lot of strategies that especially my husband, John, has been able to implement on YouTube. Um, it's just search engine optimization because it's a search engine, you know, using yep. keywords and your titles and making sure that people can find you. But yeah, most of it was organic. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it is very different. You know, on Instagram, people are like, they're, they're kind of like there to say, serve me content. And then on YouTube, they're going and actively looking for content. 
Okay. And then as yours come up, it's it is nice when people subscribe and 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 keep coming back. So your um the where are most of the emails coming in from? Would you say YouTube or Instagram? Uh, so email subscribers, most of them are coming through Pinterest. Oh, switch Plot it on. Twist. <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> um, yeah. So actually, in terms of reach, I guess I should say. Pinterest is the largest because we get yeah. two million views, two million views on our Pinterest a month. Um, so, but that that's a whole other beast too because people yeah. don't follow people on on Pinterest. Like it's yeah. not they just repin or they click the link to go see the video or read the blog post on Pinterest. It's not really a place where you follow people. Some people do that, but it's like I have I think I have like five thousand or six thousand followers on Pinterest, but I have two million views monthly views. The content's getting shared everywhere redistributed and then that's yeah. probably as in terms of marketing platform besides like paid advertising or whatever that's probably their our biggest lead generator is pinterest and then probably second to that would be instagram specifically when i'm in a launch or i'm about to be in a launch like six weeks before i start launching i start to do what's called a pre-launch runway and so i'll usually start doing stories with links to a couple lead magnets that we're running at the time to direct people to our email list that will then start nurturing them and warming them up for when we do start selling to them for the sales sequence yep. when it's actually a live course. So it really depends on the season that we're in. But I, I would say just in general, like in the background, even when I'm not launching, Pinterest is probably our biggest lead generator for the email list. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, so th I want to go back to you and your husband um, working together on the YouTube channel. What is the the production process right uh -huh. now? Is it do you guys have like your film day and then uh -huh. he just goes and edits all week, or you know, like and and how much on the creator front end is he part like design helping to design it? Like, just tell me about the the process. Yeah. So everything besides the teaching is John. So we have excuse me we have two weeks out of every month way where we have two of the two of the days in those weeks we're dedicating toward youtube or patreon because we also have a patreon which is our monthly membership where i'm doing exclusive tutorials that aren't on my youtube and then live q a's and live art classes and how many members in there just we have a curiosity. thousand members nice we launched that a year ago and we have a thousand we just crossed the barrier of a thousand it's a very difficult um, in terms of maintenance and keeping people around because it's a membership, people are paying, you know, $15 yeah, a month, you, $20 a month, whatever. You got to update that. Yeah. In, 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 yeah. And keep them interested in the topics and not everybody's interested in the same topics. It's tricky. Yeah. Yeah. So I can imagine. Yeah. So crossing a thousand subscribers to our That's Patreon, big. that was Congrats. a big, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so what was I talking? Oh, so uh, every month. Yeah. How you collaborate. The production. Yep. Yeah. So every month. We have a week or two weeks, depending on what's going on at the time, uh, dedicated to film days. And we'll film on usually Tuesday and Wednesdays. Wednesdays are uh, at 10 a.m. So this morning, today's a Wednesday. This morning at 10 a.m. I had a live art class for my Patreon. So today's a Patreon day. Um, but on Tuesdays, we're, our, we're normally filming from 8-ish or 9-ish to 12 or 1. We have about four a four-hour window where our son is being watched or he's at school or whatever, and we can just like bang out the videos. So we'll usually film the four Patreon or the four YouTube videos that we're posting, or sorry, two Patreon for YouTube, because we post once a week on YouTube, twice a month to Patreon for exclusives. Got it. And so one of those weeks, it's either YouTube, the other week is Patreon. And so we're using that window of time that we have to, you know, bang out all the videos that we have to do we post once a week on youtube so there's four tutorials or sometimes they're not tutorials sometimes they're like tips or you know just direct to camera things where i'm yep. talking about how brush techniques or whatever so sometime and those are a lot easier to film because there's not a lot of tear down setup rearranging the cameras for doing the intros and outros direct to camera oh, and yeah. then having all of the different angles for the painting and whatnot so he sets up his the equipment either the night before or morning of while I'm getting miles ready for school or whatever and then we'll film and uh because miles is only in school till about 12 or we have help till about 12 um he takes him after that and so he's he tears down the video equipment and I get back to whatever I'm working on usually it's research and development for YouTube and Patreon like 
just educating myself on how I can grow as an artist. So then therefore I can grow my community as individual artists. Um, so, you know, watching a ton of YouTube videos or reading new books and just trying out new mediums and seeing what I, what I like and what I want to start learning and educating myself on. And then when he gets back, he has the afternoon and I'll take miles and he'll be editing the whole week. Um, and you know, editing can take him anywhere from three days to six days, depending on the length of the video, how much B-roll there is and all of that. He does obviously all of the editing. He gets all the music clips, the background music. He uploads the video. He does all of the SEO um, titles. He does the thumbnail, yep. writing the description, linking to all the affiliate links that we have for supplies, getting all the chapters. Like YouTube has like the chapters that you can do for easy yep. scrolling. Yep. And once it's uploaded, he is right next to me. His desk is over there. And if there's comments that he can't answer, he's asking me just like, hey, how would you answer this question or whatever? And so oh, really? he types for me. It's essentially me answering the questions, <laughs> I love, I love the comments. It. But um, I'm working on something else and then it'll just holler at me and I'll answer. Does he ever guess what you would say? <laughs> yes. He's very good at guessing what I would say. Just full nice. transparency too. Nice. Like, nice. I, that, that probably works better in like, that works well in all areas of, of the relationship yeah. too, you know? Yeah, for sure. Oh, I mean, he's li he could literally teach the class. He could teach the videos. He doesn't have the motor skills because he's not actively painting every day. Yeah, yeah. But he could for sure teach and probably teach it almost exactly like I would if he, if I were like, how do you teach this floral watercolor painting or whatever? Like he yep. would probably nail it because he's literally watched hundreds of hours. Yeah, and, and it's definitely... um. I think the videos that you create too, tell me if I'm wrong, they could be, um, how am I going to phrase it? I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. Uh, deceptively, like, hard to produce. <laughs> like, because uh, uh, well, I noticed with Gia, because Gia does a lot of the, like, the art videos and, like, trying to time it with, like, and like getting the art right and like the narration and like try to do a couple different angles. It, uh -huh. it, it, it takes a, it takes a lot of time. It takes more time than you would think that and right. she's just doing like, you know, reels. Uh, uh -huh. And then you're doing full long productions, 10 minute videos, tutorials, breakdowns, uh, even uh -huh. some meditation stuff right now. Right. W would you uh -huh. say that that's accurate? Like, I feel like some people might look at what you're doing and be like, oh, that's, she's just doing art. But like, it, uh -huh. there's a lot that goes into it. It can be, it depends on the topic, like flowers I can paint with my eyes closed. Probably not actually, but like- You should it, try that. That could be a fun video. Should, actually, that's a really good video <laughs> idea. I'm going to tell John. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm really comfortable with flowers. And so that, the days where I know I'm painting the most of the tutorials are like something I'm really comfortable with, like flowers. You can um, run to them. It's smooth. So smooth. Yeah. But there are things like- um you know, landscapes I'm definitely comfortable in, but I don't paint them every single day. I literally paint flowers every single day. And so talking and teaching and painting at the same time, and then also worrying about like, we don't have like our equipment, our setup is amazing compared to what we've done in the past where it's been like, we have to set it up in our kitchen. And that's the only place we can do it because of the lighting and the back background and all of that. Like we just didn't have space and you know, houses that we've had previously. And so thankfully we have this amazing art studio where there's more space and we can leave equipment up if we need to. And John's lighting is just massive, it takes up so much space and like all the cameras. Um, so there's some tricky elements to it. Like, I don't know if you can see the de desk behind me. Totally. Um, but that's where we set up for our filming. And obviously people might not be able to see this. It's just audio, but it's basically like an island and I sit on a stool. And then because we don't want to show we can't have the camera on my right side because that's my dominant hand. That's my painting hand. It would block what you can see, you, like just the angle yep. that we want. We want like a low, tight, 50 millimeter lens, really tight. Um, he's on the left side. Well, that means I have to sit like really crunched like on uh, my right yeah. side. And so it's pretty awkward. Like yeah. being in that seating position is very uncomfortable and awkward. It would be smart to get like a really good zoom lens but we just don't have that right now so he can back up but he's like right next to me i can't move my stool to the left or i'll literally knock over his camera yeah so that makes that makes things a little tricky i'm thinking about that i'm thinking about what i'm painting i'm thinking about like teaching while i'm painting and those things can get, can get complicated but i've been teaching courses and youtube stuff now for it's about eight years so it's gotten a lot better and easier for me and i love teaching but it's definitely there's some there's some trickies yeah 
Yeah. So here, here, this is a question. Uh, any tips for anyone out there that's listening that works with their significant other or their partner for, <laughs> for like, I feel like that they're, they're like, is, I don't know, for me, like I, off the top of the head is like, is there a time where, you know, you turn it off like at five o'clock, we don't talk work or is it just kind of free game? <laughs> Yeah. So for us, we don't really have like a hard stop or start really. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, th I think it, it like for what forces us to have that balance is that we have a child and he's a toddler and just, at the, and at the moment. Can't. <laughs> yeah, can't. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. the interruptions are insane. That, that, that's a forcing function in <laughs> itself. <laughs> yeah. The interruptions alone would just drive you mad. You can't get anything done. Yeah. So we, we really can't have any like good, you know, forward progress conversations in the house when Miles is around. So like that at least helps to force boundaries around it. Yep. But we love what we do. We really love like talking about, I love talking about numbers and SEO and strategy and visionary type stuff. And he loves it too. He's, he's a very creative person, even though he's not like an, he, he's not actively painting or doing art things. Obviously he's a videographer and that requires creativity and stuff, but he's, he's a really creative person. He loves creative problem solving and like working out best strategies to improve our our YouTube or improve our Patreon and stuff. So we love talking about it. We love talking about work. But I think that it helps that we have a toddler to help give us a little bit of balance because I could definitely see exhaustion, <laughs> burnout, or both, you know, yeah. for couples who work together. And it's hard. There's definitely a lot of times where we're just like, we're not meeting, we're not seeing eye to eye on something and gets freaking awkward <laughs> and <laughs> quiet and we're like uh, yeah but you just have to you have to talk about it and move on yeah no and it's cool that you have like it's a it's a on just an ongoing creative project uh and sometimes with that you know ideas pop up and you you, uh -huh. you want to be oh you want to popcorn them right now and and uh and just see and see how each other is feeling about it so uh -huh. th there's this an another thing that i think you do well and you actually talk about it on your website a little bit um is i'm undeniable proof that the starving artist narrative was made to be broken uh and then with that let's sort of, like I, what, what i want to touch upon is our mindsets around selling as a creative uh -huh. because uh -huh. i know a lot of people whether it's art whether it's doing a brand deal whether it's creating a course creative people feel like um what, what i've experienced Please. is what's that like it's sleazy it's sleazy and also like our creativity is like we're kind of like oh we just want to give it we just want to give it to mm -hmm. the world in like some way but sometimes that's not always giving to yourself <laughs> you know mm -hmm. uh so the, talk to me before I, I answer the question talk to me more about yeah. how you think about selling as a creative yeah i i'm very passionate about this topic i know you said that or mentioned that you have listened to my podcast and i've had a few or at least one episode all about selling multiple episodes probably all about selling and I used to have this Facebook group that kind of fizzled out because it wasn't well planned out or anything but it kind <clears> of <throat> took its own like it became its own machine or whatever but it uh called selling without sleaze and I think the under tone or the like just the behind the scenes message of when people feel because it's not just a create creative person's problem it's a fear of failure problem it's a fear of rejection problem it's a fear or maybe even replacing that fear with tendencies toward perfectionism and you can obviously unravel that and get into childhood drama or the family yeah. system or whatever <laughs> but we don't need to go that deep mm -hmm. obviously and just like analyze that we we have issues with selling because we've we're, we you know i use this analogy of lot of like a used car salesman and no shade to John, but she, he used to work at CarMax. So he actually <laughs> was a used car salesman, <laughs> but not sleazy at all. But you think of like just rolling up to a, a used car salesman, not lot again, no shade to used car salesman. <laughs> um, and just, you know, they, we're, they yeah, like to nickel like, and dime. Yeah. Yeah. They you like to use those terms that you hear a lot. And like, it's very prevalent in the online course community of like, buy now fast action bonus you know deal ends tonight it's going up in price and all of that stuff that i know leaves a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths and i know that artists who are trying to sell and promote their work and like create some sort of revenue and profit because how else is it going to be sustainable in the way that our culture operates we need to have some sort of income to pay our rent to pay our mortgage to whatever but 
it it there's this there's this nice blend that artists and creatives just need to find for themselves because it's unique to them. I used to follow like all of the online marketers out there, you know, like Amy Porterfield and Jenna Kutcher even, and like all of these, uh, Neil Patel, all of these people, Brandon Bouchard and stuff that have very solid advice, very solid advice, like good advice, but it just is a formula that doesn't work for everyone, especially in the creative sphere. Like I found that it was good to take just like a, a piece or a portion or a morsel here and there from these people and apply it to my own business Mm -hmm. and then just talk genuinely to my people like i believe in my products like you say gia your wife your wife or girlfriend wife yeah your partner your wife (laughs) um has been taking brand plus brand i believe in that product i'm not just selling it to make a a nickel you know like i believe in that product because it's literally the system and the process that i had to go through in order to create six figures a year in revenue in licensing and selling my art and doing things to you know have this art business that's now grown to over seven figures so it's really important to yes hands up (laughs) (laughs) so it's really important to me that i am being in tune with what feels aligned like Uh it, it is good solid advice to understand the structure of how people psychologically work how they you know a seven day launch versus a 14 day launch and having a fast action bonus versus a downsell and all of these like marketing and selling terms that definitely at least provide a guideline or a skeleton but at the same time like there's alignment issues you need to believe in what you're talking about you need to believe in the value that you bring to people and what even if that's as simple as i have an etsy shop not that it's simple but you know in comparison to like an 897 dollar course that can change someone's business versus like i'm going to hang this up in my nursery that is providing somebody with joy that is providing s- someone with maybe the perfect a baby shower gift or the perfect birthday gift to somebody that they are finding this unique painting or print that they can hang on their wall. So anyway, just believing in the value. And I I would encourage any artist or creative person who maybe struggles with feeling like they're just being too pushy or too salesy or too sleazy, or they don't want to even talk about their work, that if you don't believe in the value that you bring to someone's life, nobody's going to be convinced of that value. Nobody's going to be convinced of that value. It's going to be impossible for you to sell. So it starts with value and alignment. And then from there, finding your own unique spin on how you sell. I love that. I honestly, I could talk about that subject for a long time. <laughs> like <laughs> I, it, 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 from just a lot of different angles, uh, just, just thinking about too, like all of the things that we spend in our day-to-day lives. But like, like when I go to the grocery store, I don't, I don't like resent the person I bought it from, you know, like, I, I, this is no. something I, I want and I need, you know, like okay. the same way when someone's buying your art or like consume, consuming your, you know, going through your course or whatever, like, wh- like they want it, <laughs> you know, uh-huh. like, it, okay, the belief part, that's what I want to uh-huh. go into. That's something that I've, so I, I've dabbled in like kind of building courses and uh-huh. I think that's where I get a little like uh, tentative about putting them out because I'm like, I don't know if I totally believe in it and not the, not the fact that like a, as a facilitator, like I'm like, is, are people connecting with this? Is, is there a way to build that momentum in believing in the product? Like, so for your brand plus brand course, let, uh-huh. did you, was it like a smaller version of that, that then you continue to add value to, or did you just start, start big and like, just know that it was going to be a home run from the jump? Well, it was a pretty big course to, begin with but we have we i mean it's pretty typical like strategy or whatever to update because things will get outdated especially if a lesson is platform specific like i had an email marketing course where i was showing how to set up automations in convert kit versus mailchimp and active campaign campaign and whatnot and these platforms are constantly updating their so it's always going to be outdated in a year so it's important to update your course and there's a whole strategy around like how you get surveys from people and get people to actually finish your course so that they actually get the wins that you want and then you're going to have raving reviews and testimonials and they're going to tell their friends and you can use that on your sales page and then it creates more revenue but um where was i going with this what are we talking Uh, we're talking about about sort of like how you design the course to to uh be in a position where you truly felt confident about it it yeah, yeah 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 so when I, I first started creating courses on my own, I've taught like watercolor course, online courses through this co- media company called Brayden Co. 
I've done a few courses with them and that like started I think in 2015 and then in 2018 I was eight months pregnant with my son Miles and just saw the potential of helping people build a stationary business because at the time I was designing oh, yeah. wedding stationery. Yep. Yeah. So I had done that for about five years. I was doing calligraphy and I was doing the actual invitation suite design and all the stationary needs like day of stuff, save the dates, whatever. And so I just had a lot of people in my DMs or emails or whatever asking similar, like, how do I build a similar business or how did you start or that sort of thing? Or how do you print on specific paper, that kind of thing? And so um, without having to send out a survey or do any polls on social media or whatever, I just kind of was using that essentially that like candid data that I was getting from like mm-hmm. a, a pseudo focus group of my Instagram followers and email list people. Which to is do the that best tell focus me, group. They're right, telling you exactly. <laughs> exactly. You need to listen to your people. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't have people, go on a search engine like Pinterest or YouTube and type in using keywords like how to get, how to start a wedding stationary business or how to start a creative or whatever the topic you're thinking you can educate people on is, type it in a search bar, see what the other top search searches are before you hit enter. And those are the questions. Those are lesson ideas. Those are module chapter ideas for your course. And that's the, that's honestly, if you don't have the focus group or the Instagram audience or like whatever, even if it, uh, and honestly, people get too distracted with I need to have thousands of followers like the smaller your audience is the more of a pulse you can actually have on what your people want so it's a really kind of a, a large I, I there's pros on either side but um Very anyway true. yeah there, it's all about listening to your audience so if you're really like not sure if what you're about to launch or what you're creating in the moment is going to land with people ask them send out some polls send out and through survey monkey or google forms in your email list or Go on Pinterest, go on Facebook groups of people. There's wedding stationary Facebook groups. There's wedding business Facebook groups. There's Facebook groups for literally every everything just, under the sun. <laughs> just just have, so what you're saying is just have these conversations with okay. the audience and then you'll get very clear on what you need to solve in this course and like, yes. and like how to build the content. Yes, and how to build the content and use those the people in your who are your ideal customers use their language use exactly how the questions that they're asking and how they're phrasing it is going to be really important for feeling seen when they read your sales page or feeling seen when they read about your course that's a good point that's a really yeah. great point now so when you're you're putting together the the course let's say brand plus brand but i just rough is probably hard to exactly remember but like how long did it take for you to put together that curriculum oh dude um i'm a bit uh you're gonna say three days (laughs) i i because i I don't know what it is um once you lock in (laughs) once i lock in i have add like diagnosed add so hyper focus is a real advantage that i have yeah in a lot of ways there's a lot of other disadvantages with like distraction whatnot but uh, anyway uh, I, I can bang out. Now we have a very dialed system because I have a amazing operations manager who's like, I just physically cannot <laughs> turn a course around in a month or whatever. Yeah. So when I was on my on my own with Pin to Press spe- specifically, I was literally by myself. I hired a videographer. John wasn't doing video at the at the time because he had a completely different day job. He wasn't working with me and he never like played or messed with any cameras um 2018 and so i filmed it with a separate video company i um uploaded everything in kajabi i set up all of the sales sequence email campaigns i set up all the lead magnets literally all the landing pages for the lead magnets the sales page copy i designed it myself i wrote it myself and i was eight months pregnant and i had pneumonia which was (laughs) insane But that was like, I whipped it out in probably three or four weeks. And that nearly, like, I don't, I don't recommend. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, well, and is that course still active? Is, uh-huh. is Pender Press still active? And are people, yeah. is it like on Evergreen? So it's Evergreen, but we're not. So currently don't... we don't have active automations for it. So okay. we have blog posts that like mention it and link to it. So if people stumble on those blog posts, which people do or whatever, or old YouTube videos where I talk about it, they can click the link and they can buy it. It's open, but we don't have it built in like an evergreen, evergreen. What did I just say? Evergreen? Uh, Evergreen. uh, Like an evergreen funnel or automation where like it's, 
where, for example, if I do a webinar and it's the webinar, there's like four different times or whatever, we choose the best performing webinar and that webinar, we drive Facebook ads or something to it every day to generate traffic to that webinar. When people sign up for it, they're then funneled into an automation in our email service provider that starts to nurture them, warm them up to the idea of purchasing the course and then eventually pitching to them. So for, for like automations, it's not automated. It's just, yes, you can buy it anytime. So it's technically evergreen, but it's not like actually automated. And, and, and what are the price points of your courses? So you have pen to press, you have brand plus brand I know of, and then uh, the art within. Uh -huh. What are all the price points of them? Yeah, so my those are my three signature courses, and then I have about, uh, I want to say, three or four mini courses that are under $100, which is the kind of the strategy or whatever behind mini offers. But we have three signature courses. Pen to Press is $4.97. We might have just lowered it to $3.97 because it's just evergreen, and yeah. we're not updating it regularly. We're not, like, adding a community or anything like we do with our other signature courses. We have Brand Plus Brand, which is eight ninety seven currently, and it has a lot of updates that we're doing. So we're currently thinking about raising it to nine ninety seven, um, and then we have the Art Within, which is four ninety seven, and that is uh, my most different course. All of my courses are creative business, creative entrepreneur focused, and the Art Within is like basically how to create your best work by utilizing the neuroscience behind flow state and tapping into your optimal style your best style creating your style and developing muscle memory through the foundations like shading perspective vantage point all that kind of stuff so it's a very different topic it's more the lead generator the highest lead generator for that course is obviously youtube because i can talk about it very freely on my youtube channel because everything is art focused on that channel so then just naturally at the end of every single video i mention ways that they can take it take the next step with their art and art within happens to be one of them i have so many questions uh <laughs> So in all right, in that conversation, you said the smaller courses. You said they're they're the strategy. So the strategy behind mini offers are like the smaller bite yeah. size. Like we take you to step A and B, but the signature courses take you A B C D three, A B C D oh. three four five six. I just switched so, to numbers. Yeah, no, no. So that's what I was getting at earlier when I was like, do you kind of have like smaller versions of the course? So like for me, for example, if I were to come up with a podcast course, uh -huh. um. Part of what I would say is like it'd be like I have an idea for like a mini version that is just all about your first 10 episodes because sometimes people overthink the whole process and want to build the mega show right away. Okay. But I think it'd be better just to focus on like the fundamentals of your yeah. first 10 episodes and for like sure. kind of like the strategy around how to go about that and make that a mini course. And then maybe in the future, make a longer like how to monetize all the things from there. Is that sort of. I, you're you think about it a little bit on your end or, or? Um, essentially so so it kind of goes to you have to trail it all the way back to your lead magnet um or your free offer that can be a webinar that can be like a cheat sheet or a checklist or some sort of download um or like a challenge like a video series challenge or something so you want to think about your webinar or your freebie being like the what and the why behind your method so creating mm -hmm. a podcast the what and the why is the freebie how why would you start a podcast because you can reach tons of people you can establish yourself as an expert in your industry all of these things that's the you why can, you can write my copy for it I can. <laughs> <laughs> and then the how is the mini offer if you choose to have one and then also the how like on a whole other level is your signature offer the reason why i like to kind of it's not like a uh step a and b is in the mini offer and then the rest is in the signature offer it might even just be like how um how do we like get all the tech that we need to get all of the like tutorials around the tech is in your mini offer and that's your under a hundred dollars like 47 dollars or 97 dollars whatever you decide to value it at and then like how do we actually scale and grow the podcast and take it to another level is your signature offer and so then if you're automating and you're turning this evergreen, or even if you're not turning it evergreen, you're doing live launches or whatever, then you could use that mini offer as a way to add value during your live launch or during whatever launch you're doing with your signature offer. You could have like a fast action bonus. You can grab my mini offer for a 50% discount if you purchase my signature mm -hmm. offer 
before the next 24 hours, 48 hours. And that goes back to what we were originally talking about, about like selling and feeling sleazy and using all these marketing tactics and whatever. And there's a little bit of like, I used to feel weird about like using fast action bonuses or expiring deadlines and all of this stuff. But when you look at the data, when you look at how, like how little of not just revenue, but impact, if you really believe in what you're providing, you're leaving impact on the table. You're, You're letting someone who could have a successful podcast then not have a successful podcast because they're they're last minute buyers or they're like, oh, I'll get to it in six months since it's available whenever I want. I'll just, I'll remember in six months and I'll buy it in six months. They won't remember in six months. And so having that fast action bonus or those deadlines creates that fear of missing out that FOMO and it makes people actually buy it. Yeah. And with that too, I I don't know. uh, I, I think maybe other people could relate. I don't know if you do, but sometimes um, when you invest in something, you're just more likely to like want yes. it to work. That's <laughs> and I find that, you know, freebies, like some of the, some of the freebies I download, like they're probably could have been sold for a hundred dollars and then mm-hmm. I don't even look at them again. But if it was a yes. hundred dollars, I'm telling you, I would read that whole thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I forget who says this, but those who pay, pay attention. It's the most, yeah. like I know, I and, and it doesn't mean you have to finish the course or even start it like right after you buy it or anything. Like as long as the people, and there's obviously a whole a lot of strategy behind like getting people, encouraging people to actually start the course and finish the course. That's a whole other topic. But um, there are people who pay, pay attention. And yeah. it's true. Like when I've invested in, in scary things, like where I'm spending a couple grand on a course and I'm like, I don't know, this seems really risky. Like that's a very expensive course, but <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to take time to go through that. freaking course. Yeah, <laughs> I'm literally taking my Google calendar and I'm scheduling, okay, I have an hour this Friday. I'm going to just recur that task and I'm going to spend an hour every single Friday so I can go through this entire course and actually utilize this investment and make the effort and yeah. see, the, see the return in my business or whatever. Yeah, that's such a good point. Uh, that's such a great point. Uh, the, the, and so with the Brand Plus Blend course, I have a question about that one, um, okay. the curriculum in there. So you did um, a collaboration. Or like there's some modules in there or lessons where you uh, have your agent in the conversation. Okay. Okay. And I'm curious... Because I thought about that too. Like, I, uh, is what's the is there like a business like the relationship with her showing up in there? Because like from and I, I, you can do it through my scenario. Like I would, if I did a podcast course, I would want to have like five people on that have five different styles of like how okay. they host their show. Okay. And I'm like, what can I do? I have to pay them? Like, like what's sure. sort of the setup there? <laughs> Yeah, so I have a lot of guest expert interviews in a lot of my courses. The Art Within has a bunch of people in there. Like I have people who are breathwork experts and meditation experts, neuroscience, like MDs and stuff in that course and unpaid um, when it's an interview. And it's like people, similar to a podcast, people are so like ready and willing to do most any podcast because of the exposure and the experience of like dialing in your spiel and the way you talk and like just growing And so it's similar to a podcast where people mostly, most of the time, you won't have to pay people. I've been paid, for example, I think it was Emily Jeffords course. She paid me like 500 bucks to be a guest expert in her course, Making Artwork, I think is what it's called. And I talked about licensing. And so sometimes you'll pay people, but it really depends. I found that most people just want to do it for free. And with Julie, who is my licensing agent, she she took on a lot of the content in brand plus brand and also the name itself was her like she came up with the name she we started writing the course like right when i started working with her back in 2019 and so i had just come off of a very successful first launch with pen to press and i was like well now people are starting to ask about licensing because i'm starting to do like yoga towels and all of these different products with my work on it and working with julie and so would you want to collaborate and create and so it was a lot of, it was a lot of it was mutual effort all of the like marketing and behind the scenes stuff is on me because julie doesn't have an online course business and she doesn't have and you know all these funnels in her email list and so yeah. all of that is on me but it's more of a collaborating on the whole course thing with her yep. than my other courses the where i just have people where i'm interviewing them totally totally you yeah, know that that makes sense and and um 
Yeah, I, I was. Someone told me that because I, I have ideas for like you know workshops that would be sponsored by 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 brands or whatever. And I was working with like someone that like knows the world really well, and she was. I was like, yeah, I'll have guests on, and I can, I can pay them. She was like, honestly, like a lot of them would just be happy if you're able to get the audience, and they can come uh-huh. get in front of a new audience and 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 go yes. through their spiel. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. And then another thing I'm thinking about too is just with the mindset of like what a course like brand brand does. Okay, it's a basically like business operations for uh, the whole business strategy and and like and operations for how to make money as a l- licensed artist, right? Like, as like as I don't know where else like you, you, like like. G- Geo with the school for de- graphic design, like Less. they didn't teach her that there, you know. But like, no. but like in college, you, you for some reason we're so quick to like throw all of our money there, and like there's no promised ROI on that, uh-huh. you know. And uh-huh. then for some reason, when a course creator that actually real time you, you're making money with this business model now, you're saying uh-huh. I'm in the game. I'm telling you how the game's being played, and yeah. you can steal my model. Like that, I I just find it. Uh, so valuable and I, I i always like to turn the volume up on those types of examples so i'm I'm like i'm ex- really excited that we're highlighting this now in this conversation yeah. no it's it's definitely the most common objection that people have with buying any of our courses whether it's just you know the art within not just but you know just like an art course versus a business course is the cost and that's my always my response and we have amazing feedback from our students who, for example, with the Art Within, we have students inside the Art Within that went to art school, that studied art in their university and saying to us, like, I literally didn't learn any of this stuff in art school and I'm in like thousands of dollars in debt. Like, oh where my was goodness. Yours? Yeah, I'm and paying same thing it all with for business. 20 years. Yeah. Right. And yeah. same thing with the business courses. It's like, I don't know what it is, but we just don't talk about the like actually running a business in business school. But and obviously every school is different. We're not so like not bashing shade. everything. Yeah, yeah, and, not and, bashing everything. And, and, and I think yeah, there's, there's a, a lot. There's to a lot learn. of pros and cons. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. just the the mindset around like mm-hmm. for some reason because like we took a loan out to to throw it at it. Like it, it's right. it's different than buying the actual map that you've created. And it's a fraction of the cost and, and a fraction. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and and uh, I think to the um. Oh, you were talking about like g- people going through the entire course. I'm curious what your thinking is, and I'm going to tell you why I'm, I'm I'm bringing that back up. Because sometimes I don't know if you do this. I'll buy courses knowing I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Like yeah. I want I want like the third module. Actually, I'm fine on one and two, but I want that the- third one. Mm-hmm. Which is totally normal and fine. There's going to be a definite amount of like a chunk of people who are going to go about it that way. That's why it's super important how you title, how you name your lessons. Because oh, when yeah. people see that on your sales page and they have to like kind of read a really long sentence or it doesn't really fully describe the like, if you can't explain it in less than 10 seconds, people are gone. So if you can't explain every single le- lesson title or people don't explain it in their head when they're reading it. So like subconsciously, they're just like reading it and they're like, oh, I get it. That's ex- I know exactly what's in that lesson. And if it's attractive to them, they might just buy it just based on that one lesson, three lessons, whatever. I've done that. Yeah. And a lot of people do that. So that's why it's really important to name your lessons and make it short, make it sweet to the point. What's the biggest like takeaway or pain point that you address in that lesson? And so and then it goes into strategy behind like, how long do you make each lesson? Like five minute lessons are sometimes the biggest performing lessons, like the best lessons, the most valuable lessons are the shorter ones sometimes because they don't have to scrub through the video and find the part that they want and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, that, to have it. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm, I don't want to cut you off, but I just did by accident. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that, 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 that leads me to the, the next idea. I don't know if you were going there, but like from pen to press to how you designed the art within uh-huh. What are like other like things like that you've um, maybe reapproached with how you create the course, whether that's like the copy on the website or just like the length of the the lessons? Like, do you have a a kind of a standard for like how long your lessons are and how how long you wish them to be? Yeah, we have a general standard. Like, there's anywhere between honestly five minutes. And I don't like to go above 35 minutes. If I do, it's usually in my interviews because yeah. it's like you know, easier to listen it's in easier on that. in the yeah. flow. You don't want to like, okay, we're now going to stop here and then we're going to start a different lesson with this topic. And then, so it's just, it's easier when you're doing interviews to continue the flow with the person you're interviewing to just keep talking. 
Um, and so sometimes those will be like 45 minutes to an hour, maybe a little bit over an hour. And that's fine. People are like really invested. Usually they're like podcasts and people um, can, uh, and also too courses, people can treat it like a podcast and they can just put headphones in and not watch it. So that's another kind of strategy too behind what you teach, especially if it doesn't have to be visual, like a design course or something. But um, yeah, we try to have it roughly around anywhere from five minutes to 35 minutes, but always making sure that there's one to three big takeaways, like big, like they could put tangible action into this right now and see results in it um, from each one of our lessons. Uh, no, no, no. That's so, big. Yeah. That's big. Like each one helps you get from A to B. Like you will, you're solving something right. in each each lesson, not just Which fluff. then makes them want to take more of the course because if it's just one big long video, um, then they're like, well, I got a lot out of that. I now have to spend like a week digesting everything or go even going through the video. And then they're not likely to go to the next video because it's just so overwhelming. You don't want to overwhelm people. And so having it in bite-sized chunks, chunks really helps to make it more streamlined and smooth for people actually finishing. And I also heard that's a good strategy for updating it in the future. So if you have like four really long lessons, it's harder to like go in and like, like, yes. <laughs> like, just, like interject in that, in it that has. module or that lesson. And then you can just go in and create new three to four or five minute yep. um, lessons and, and pop them in there. Yep. I had to learn that the hard way with my <laughs> pen to press. And even with the first launch of brand plus brand, we had really long videos cause it was the first time and I was launching on my own. And then as of the last two years, we've gotten really specific with how we design courses, the flow of courses and stuff. And so we had to, at first, we were breaking up our really long interview lessons or really long lessons in Brand Plus Brand and, and Pen to Press and like having an awkward stop point and then a little fade and then a fade into it in the <laughs> next lesson. And it's just awkward. Mm -hmm. So keeping that in mind, if you are creating a course, those listening to like keep it short and sweet, bite sized chunks. And then also another tip too that I learned the hard way was do not title or number, sorry, do not number your lessons in the intro like thumbnail. Don't put numbers on it because mm, you might add something you, that goes move before it around. and yeah. move it around. So I did that with Pen to Press. I had, you know, topic was scanning and digitizing your artwork lesson one or whatever. And then that became lesson three because I added steps to my process. And then I wanted to update lessons to Pen to Press to show those added steps to my process. And then step one was then yeah. step three. So you literally have to retake the whole video. And then nowadays too, in like the course platforms, you can just number it there. So it's like, it's just self-explanatory mm -hmm. to yeah, the you don't, audience. Like they yeah. don't need to see it again. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, speaking of what course, what course platform do you use? And then what email uh -huh. platform do you use? So we use Kajabi for our courses and um, we use Active Campaign for the email list. I've gone, I've done three different uh like bouts of time on three different email service, service provide, providers. When I started my business, so I was on MailChimp, hated it, and then moved over to Drip because I had a marketing director who had a lot of experience in Drip. And it was more like, it was definitely more robust than MailChimp. MailChimp is pretty basic, mm -hmm. um, but it was so, so much of a headache anytime I would have to design workflows or automations or like upload emails. It was just like a very, like, code like web developer guys like it like it's just not okay. the vibe yeah, yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah. me yeah and like i i love and i nerd out on all of that sc on all of the like email marketing stuff but it was just it was too complicated and like html this and that so like we moved to active campaign um because we were in this like kind of mastermind coaching group on courses and elevating course businesses over the last couple of years me and my operations manager and that's the system they use and so all of their trainings are in active campaign so we decided to switch migrate over to active campaign which is a huge headache by the way um mm -hmm. to active campaign so that we could get like actual feedback on the same platform and then so you talked about a uh, team uh, a couple of times you got operations mm -hmm. uh, your husband that leads uh video creative is there anyone else on your team so in terms of like people dedicated full-time, no, it's ah, just me. Okay, yeah. Me, John is full-time. He's, you know, on salary, whatever. Then Kelly, my operations manager. We have a ton of freelancers, um, depending on what the needs are in the moment. We're currently about to hire a virtual assistant um, who would be another team member that we'll add on. And then we do have uh, my operations manager's husband, actually. Uh, his name's Andres. He works for 
a big corporation actually out in Pennsylvania, um, Hershey. Oh. Probably heard of it, the mm-hmm. chocolate. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. he does all of their financial data and analysis. And so he does that for us. So every quarter, every okay. month, actually, he's putting together reports and financial projections. And it's actually been an, a huge game chamber, changer having someone um, freelance who's able to do that for us and like break down, not just break down profit and loss, but also to do like financial analysis on like how to price things in a price breakdown and how to do projections. And if I charge $5 for this and my hard costs are this, my variable costs are this, then uh-huh. here's how much I should mark it up, that kind of thing. So it's been a game changer. But And then we have like an ads manager person who's freelance. We have a copywriter sometimes when I just don't have the bandwidth to do it myself. Got it, got it. So yeah, depending on the project, you might hire okay. out. Okay, so what about the whole br- the breakdown of the business? We have courses, Patreon. Uh, do, do you do... so? Uh, art licensing books. Um, okay. Do you, is there any brand collabs or or YouTube ads re- revenue in that? Oh yeah, we get we get um, from Google AdSense and affiliate income from YouTube. So that generates monthly income. Obviously, Patreon is a monthly membership, but because we monetize our channel, so that just means that people have ads on our our yeah. YouTube videos. Um, we get money every single month from Google AdSense. That's just the the way it's integrated with YouTube is through Google AdSense, is through your ad money. And then um, we have, every video has obviously the supplies that I'm using. And so I'm using affiliate links from either Blick or Amazon because if I'm going to promote your product because I actually really believe in it and use it every single day and not get money or not get kickbacks. Yeah. Yeah, you might so. as well. So, okay, uh, can is, do you have a rough percentages of um, the overall business of like <laughs> uh, of them off top, or, or is would that be hard? No, I do. Okay. Um, general, I mean, just based yeah, off yeah, of yeah. what like, I remember from our team retreat and yeah. reviews and stuff. But uh, definitely, biggest revenue generator is course. Courses yeah. are our largest lump sum of income every single year. Um, I want to say that's almost fifty percent, or somewhere around fifty percent of our. Uh, gross revenue is from online courses and then from there it trickles down into patreon and youtube are the most exciting because their curve their growth curve is the most steady and it's like it's constantly growing yeah courses are also constantly growing but there's also a lot of expenses with courses because we have to spend that we track all of our time in asana and through ever hour so we're like allocating what it cost for all of the team members to create the videos to teach them to write the outlines to upload all of that stuff so like the the um cost on making a course is expensive but once it's made the upkeep is less expensive so like currently we're creating a lot of courses (laughs) yeah and currently we're creating a lot of courses so our expenses are a little bit higher now but the the upkeep is going to be very minimal in the next like year or two years so that'll be kind of more steady so anyway, our biggest lump sum for gross revenue is online courses. Steady, uh, like second or whatever, would be through YouTube and Patreon, and we kind of lump those together. Uh, but I do have my watercolor books; those are up there as well. I generate probably fifty thousand a year from sales that through uh, my publisher, and then I also have affiliate income through that as well. Um, and um, that's just kind of passive happening in the background. Like, you know, people are buying books, like Barnes & Noble or whatever is buying books from my publisher, and I'm not having to do any work or effort. Um, and then licensing is pretty minimal because I've been so, so focused on um, education and growing my online course business, and it's still a, a good amount of income. It's not like I'm bummed about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love any extra income and I love like collaborating with brands and getting my art on products and stuff. And so it's super fun. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So, so no, uh, like brand deals or brand collabs in there. No, I don't do paid partnerships if that's what you mean. I yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I kind of love that. I love uh, that so much. I've, I've always been, I have a lot of, not a lot, but I have a couple, a handful of, um, like actual influencer friends that I've made recently. And I always just throw shade on them and it love, like very <laughs> loving, funny way. And they, they totally, it's funny, well, but like, it's, it's just never been my vibe. I've always been the anti-influencer. I do have a large audience and I do get literally daily emails of people saying, Hey, can you do our teeth whitener thing? And we'll pay you or like three stories and for they'll probably pay you a lot. 
too. Uh, well, yeah, influencers <laughs> make a lot of money. You can make 15 grand for three stories. Yeah. <laughs> like with my audience size. So yeah. it's it's a it's money, but it's also not because then you're turning people off to your other products because you're just becoming advertisements. That, that, yes. And also what I've noticed is even with me with a much smaller following cuz I start I took a couple brand deals early on, uh you yeah. start to create content for the brand deals. Like, uh-huh. so that future brand partners will, like, measure you based on that. And then yeah. you stop thinking about your audience and you start uh-huh. thinking more about, the brand like, deals. selling out for these brand deals. And, like, really? and I just didn't like that, like, way of creating. Like, I'm not totally yeah. against brand deals, like, when it when, when it's fully aligned and it, like, makes sense. Uh-huh. Um, like, like, if sure, it was like, hey, like, mention us in your podcast. I'm like, yeah, yeah. let's do it. And I, I, I think podcast, too, is one of the, since people are kind of primed to hearing podcasts, brand reads it's like kind of at the beginning of shows like it's kind of like the in my opinion like kind of the easiest way to do the the brand collabs sure. but like going on instagram and like yelling to the cool. world go buy this like that's a it, it's can be a little different yeah same thing with youtube and podcasts like it's a little bit like people are used to advertisements on youtube videos so it's exactly. a little bit yep. easier to be like by the way this video <laughs> is brought to you by this brush or company or whatever yeah and you're um, already but- using it Right. And I'm already using it. Um, but yeah, it just, it, it fits more. I've, I've found like the influencer scene fits more in the like wellness and fitness because like those brands like Adidas or Nike or, you know, health brands, food brands even are a bit more willing, or maybe they have more of a budget for influencer marketing. Art related brands do not value influencer marketing. I mean, I, I don't want to yeah. say it so harshly, but like the creative sphere it's much harder to you just you don't see influencers in in the creative sphere yeah, you don't I, really see it i've noticed that too in like the like the video or like audio spaces because like people so many people use them and promote them anyway so like why would we I mean, pay people to to do that yeah uh, so the work around there is just using affiliate links and that's what we do but. yeah that's a good call okay um okay. so let's talk about the art within uh, mm-hmm. and the art within, I love the concept of it. Um, I'm curious, uh, is there any, any of the insights from what you teach in art within, can any of that, does any of that carry over to like, um, your creator brand? So like the, the content that you put out, uh, the courses that you create, any of the, the techniques. So I'm going to, I have some of the copy here from the website. Um, uh-huh. Even some of the lessons you learned as an artist that you've been able to apply as a creator for your your YouTube and as an online educator, or like uh, talking about the common core thought p- patterns that are holding uh-huh. creative people back. I feel like there could be some overlap between an artist and someone that's trying to start a YouTube channel. For sure, there's a, so the first section of the course is all about negative core beliefs, and we address like perfectionism, we address imposter syndrome, the root causes of them. And I actually do a guest expert interview with her name is Andrea Fagenholtz, and she's a hypnotherapist and EFT tapping expert, which is basically an acupressure technique, tapping on meridians of your face to help you create new neural pathways in your brain. So you're kind of like talking through different statements that help you rephrase. You take the negative core belief and you replace it with something that reframes it. So if you're like feeling anxious that day or you're struggling with perfectionism and you're you're like frustrated with your creative experience or it can apply to anything really yep. then you take that and you thank it for and it might sound a little bit woo but you're literally I'm thanking with it. I'm that with you're, it. yeah <laughs> you're thanking that negative just emotion that comes up or that negative belief or thought pattern that comes up saying thank you for showing me what i don't want and then replace it with something that you do want. Oh. I want to feel I want to feel fulfilled. I want to feel like I'm proud of my artwork. I want to feel like I value what I'm sharing with the world or whatever and replace that by literally training your mind to replace it. And it takes time and dedication and repetition to trick essentially your mind to carve out new shore- shorelines as I like to call them or new neural pathways in your brain because you think about like an actual shoreline with the ocean beating on a shoreline over and over again in the same spot, it's going to have a very hard edge to it. It's going to have a drop off. That's the same thing with our recurring thoughts. It's like a pounding wave that's creating an edge in our brains, a a neural pathway in our brains. That's really hard to get out of. Sometimes I really empathize with people who are stuck in like anxious thoughts or negative core beliefs, whatever. Anyway, spiel tangent. 
But we address that first because that is something that I think is fundamental, not just to art and creativity is getting past negative core beliefs and learning how to rephrase them and reframe them, but to anything like to being a business owner, being a mom and not feeling guilty or having mom guilt or being a good friend, a yep. good daughter. So we address that. And then there's a lot applicable in section one. Section two is all art stuff. So it's like foundations of art stuff. We talk about perspective and vantage point and developing muscle sp- certain muscle skills to help you drop into flow state and we talk about color theory and harmonies and a lot of stuff i don't talk about on youtube or my patreon yep and that's in section two and then in section three it's all about flow state and the neuroscience behind flow state how it works and we go through the four phases of flow and the, all the different triggers that can help you drop into flow through like interviews and stuff okay i got a question well, that, that's where we're going to lean into is the if you're um say a lot of people right now they, they usually kind of have a, a full-time job that are like trying to also start a youtube channel or like build this artist pro the, uh, this creative project on the side so they probably have like a pocket of like two or three hours or even less to like try to you know be able to dedicate that towards in the day I'm trying to... let's think about that person like what can they do if they're making a youtube channel let's say let's just use watercolor like or and they want to get in that flow state like what is to... What is like the, the quickest thing that we can help them, the quickest okay. way we can get them to kind of get in th- into that mode? Yeah. So there's a lot of different flow triggers, as they're called. This isn't just a term I've coined. This is from Flow Research Collective. And there is the basically the godfather of flow state. His name is, he's a Hungarian psychologist, and his name is really a lot of consonants, but it's Mihai Cheek sent Mihai. Yep. And um, he's like the godfather of flow. Anyway, so there's what's been coined called flow triggers. And there's a lot of different flow triggers. For example, meditation basically mirrors the exact same brain waves and patterns that we have when we're in flow state. So you're producing theta and alpha brain waves when you're in a deep meditative state. So meditation is a amazing practice that I do every day or try to at least do a few minutes of every single day to help me train my brain that this is a comfortable place. This is a mm-hmm. place where we create our best work, where athletes are performing their best and everyone can drop into flow state. You're actually dropping into flow state twice every single day. It's It mimics uh, when you're about to fall asleep or when you're just waking up in the morning. So twice every single day where we are producing the same brain waves that we are when we're in a deep flow state doing something creative or whatever. And so meditation is a good one. I also like to do not journaling because I've always been turned off by the idea of journaling and it's different. You want to do what's called automatic writing exercises, which The Artist's Way, if anybody's read that book, or automatic writing exercises is a psychological thing that a lot of people have used in psychology and counseling and therapy and stuff. But um, uh, it's basically just writing what comes to what comes out. You're not judging it. You're not thinking about it. And it's just coming out and spend five minutes and that will drop you into flow. That's one of my favorite ones to do, actually. Uh, oh, yeah. I'll just brain dump on a page, free write, free consciousness. It'll be like just like random flow, and then and then Excellent. and then what happens is like I'll the, there'll be like a little phrase. I know that they they I think part of the principle is to like not even use that, but every now and then there'll be like a phrase or two. I'm like, oh, there's something there. Like there's a, there's an idea here, and yeah. it's just kind of getting like the the like the junk out of like mm-hmm. <laughs> out of your brain yes. and like getting to the clearer thoughts. Mm-hmm. For what, sure. What about what about one more, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Nutrition, quick, Ooh. quick, quick nutrition test. Because, twist. <laughs> well, no. So, so, uh, Gia told me to ask ask you about that. Okay. Uh, she's because I think you 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 mentioned it uh, uh on maybe probably on, on Instagram. Yeah. But I I kind of geek out about nutrition. Like I I love oh, it. Fun. It's like kind of a, it's a fun hobby for me to like. Okay. I love like reading packaging. I I I, I, I you know I love like Food finding labels. new fun ways to make sweet potatoes or like. Fine. grilled plantains <laughs> you know, just like yeah. stuff that like people come over they're like yo why can't you just eat normal dude but like, i i, <laughs> I love it and i and i and i connect it to um when i eat processed food like i don't feel good and i want to feel good uh-huh. <laughs> when i eat overly processed carbs especially like so i'm curious like, <laughs> I, I i i have no like baseline of like even like um like your your approach on nutrition but i'm curious as it comes no. to creativity how it might show up it's a huge part of my life. Nutrition, yeah. lifestyle, sleep, like all of the whatever you want to call it. But you, I hate this word, but biohacking things. Yeah. And well, if you think like an athlete, like it's like the off the court stuff that uh, you kind of got to get get uh-huh. right. So when you are in, in your creative mode, like uh-huh. you can totally focus and be present. Absolutely. And I, I kind of actually touch on this in my course, The Art Within, because nutrition especially is a huge part 
and circadian medicine is a huge, huge part of my life just because it affects me drastically. If I don't get morning sunlight and yeah. I don't get that infrared light in my eyes, I don't set my circadian clocks to the light and dark cycles of the earth, um, my sleep will be affected. If my sleep is affected, my mood is affected. I'm more irritable. I'm less able to drop yeah. in a flow state. I'm frustrated with what I'm creating and I'm pissed. <laughs> yeah. I'm tired, you know, like all of these things. And then even more apparent, is the food that I'm eating. If I'm ordering out or I'm ordering Postmates or whatever, there's probably seed oils or it's processed or it's fried or whatever. And the dressing and the salad has seed oils, whatever. That's literally going to, because your gut brain access, you're connected through your vagal nerve and you want to, you know, have open communication between your gut and your brain. And so when I eat something that's going to cause inflammation, there's a whole lot of taboo around this topic, but I feel it. I really yeah. do. And I feel the brain fog. I feel the sluggishness. I feel the mood imbalances and there's there's 5-HTP, there's GABA, there's serotonin that gets 95% of serotonin is made in your gut. So of course, when your mood is off, your focus is off and you're, you know, having struggles with that, there's something going on in your gut as well. It's not just your brain, which is a huge part to play as well. But like if there's something affecting your gut's ability to create the trigger for serotonin in your brain then there, I would assume, just like logically speaking, that food and what you put into your gut is having a big impact on it. So, yes, anyway. I love it. I love it. <laughs> what about, you said that you um, you said that you had uh, like a sauna. Do you do, you do any of the, the cold exposure type stuff? I do cold showers every, or pretty much every day. Yeah. Sometimes I skip it depending on like how I'm feeling. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the next, the next, purchase in our little we have like a deck right outside the studio it has our barrel sauna and then like a few lounge chairs or whatever for like getting sun yeah um but the next like purchase because they're freaking expensive is a cold yeah plunge. yeah yeah i think i think the shower the shower covers it for <laughs> a little more for, budget budget for friendly. now um yeah. all right and and then i think we can kind of just one more question is is um uh it, just the idea of enjoying the process of making art. Like what um, is the, what is a tip that you would give someone that is like feeling like struggling right now and just wants to get back to like that enjoyment, playful stage of, of creating, creating and, again. Yeah. I, w I would um, give, I guess people the, the freedom to explore their interests. Like for me, I've become kind of bored to be honest with watercolor the past couple of years. And so exploration and, like picking up new mediums. Like I just picked up oil pastels. Like I haven't played with oil pastels since I was probably in sixth grade or something. And just like doing things that are creative, that are outside what you're doing more consistently. Like for me, it's watercolor every day or whatever. Or maybe for you, someone else, it's photography or oil or whatever. Having a creative outlet that has nothing to do with your career, nothing to do with work, mm -hmm. to just have a, a like a nice injection of inspiration and excitement and it's like finding new love like you you become obsessed when you click with the with the and this has to do with flow state too but the first phase of flow is struggle there's always a struggle phase so there's always a struggle phase when you're learning something new there's always a struggle phase and that that can people can get stuck there and that's why we address negative core beliefs but once you're once you go beyond that you move into the like new love phase where you're obsessed with that new thing and it it carries over into every aspect of your life, not just art things. So I think it's really important to have an outside creative creative outlet to really have that that feeling. I I I, I agree with you so much on that. It does carry over. Uh, that like just having that. I I whenever anyone's like feeling like blocked, I'm like pick up a side creative hobby or like a project mm -hmm. where I think this is a big one that you're the boss of, where you have the autonomy there to make the decisions because so much Have in more. like our day jobs or like other other things we, we got going on where like we have to like kind of do stuff the way other people want to we have to like kind of follow That's orders better. but like have something where you can just like make the decisions what you want it to be even if it doesn't turn out great and then and then uh approach it with that playful experimental approach that that jenna just talked about uh mm. jenna thank you so much for coming on the show this was a lot thanks of thanks for having me this was yeah, a fun was jam fun. session that was one of my favorite podcasts, actually. Good job interviewing. Let's clip that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I genuinely just uh, love what you're doing with the with the brand. I really think it's like the it's such a cool, 
you know, obviously the, the word creator economy is buzzing, right? And like, uh, yours is such a cool approach because you are an artist that is just building and using these tools. And like, yeah, you technically call it a creator, but you're an artist at heart. And like, these are just the tools you're using to to help serve and educate people and provide value. And I think you're doing a wonderful job at it. And this is an awesome conversation. Where uh, we, where can we send everyone? JennaRainey.com? Yep, JennaRainey.com. I have a lot of like blog posts every week coming out on creative tips, art tips. My YouTube is Jenna Rainey Channel. So you can just do YouTube.com forward slash Jenna Rainey Channel to find me on YouTube. My Instagram is at Jenna Rainey. Jen, Jenna Rainey. <laughs> Jenna Rainey. Um, and Patreon and whatnot is JennaRainey.com forward slash Patreon. All my online courses are on JennaRainey.com. But back to you, though. Thank you so much for this interview. This was a lot of fun.